Jonah. Turn to the book of Jonah. Jonah chapter 3 as we continue our study through this. We didn't complete last week and so I'm going to pretty much bring us up to speed, do a little bit of review of that, and then complete our study from last week. And uh, obviously next week we'll take a little bit of break on Jonah, and then we'll pick that back up on September 11th. But like again, don't let that keep you away from next week. So I know it'll be a blessed time uh, together. But Jonah chapter 3, let's stand in honor to God's word. Let's read all of chapter 3. It's only 10 verses, and uh, it should sound familiar because we read it last week. Jonah 3, 1 through 10. It says, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and proclaim to it the proclamation which I am going to tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, a three days walk. Then Jonah began to go through the city one day's walk, and he cried out and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh will be overthrown. Then the people of Nineveh believed in God, and they called the fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. When the word reached the king of Nineveh, he arose from his throne, laid aside his robe from him, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat on the ashes. He issued a proclamation, and it said, In Nineveh, by the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let man, beast, herd, or flock taste a thing. Do not let them eat, uh, do not let them eat or drink water, but both man and beast must be covered with sackcloth. And then let men call on God earnestly, that each may turn from his wicked way and from the violence which is in, in his hands. Who knows, God may turn and relent and withdraw his burning anger so that we will not perish. When God saw their deeds, that they turned from their wicked way, then God relented concerning the calamity which he had declared he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. Praise God for that, right? Let's pray. Well, again, thank you, Lord, for your word, and Lord, teach us through the ministry of your spirit and just the ability to comprehend and think and, and to find pleasure in what your word says. And so teach us, God. Uh, apply it to our lives even today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. So, um, like I said, we're going to cover just a little bit of a review. Last week, I had four different statements that it was an A, B, C, D. By the way, if you have last week's notes that you started filling out, um, you may just want to throw away today's except for just the announcements and the prayer request, but it's, it's the same thing. It's exactly the same except for the little title and the dates changed. Other than that, the content of the notes is exactly the same because we didn't finish it. So you may just want to you know, pull out those old ones from last week and keep building uh, if you have them, and uh, rather than trying to bring two things together. Uh, but we had that A, B, C, and D, those four different statements. We've got through the first two of them, and the fact that when God is calling, God calls and puts a call upon uh, people's life. And we, we looked at that from the context of Jonah. We remember back in Jonah chapter 1, in the first couple of verses, we see that God called Jonah, right, the first time, and his initial response was, I'm out of here. Um, and he goes the other direction. He doesn't want to be obedient to that. We saw that God pursued him. Uh, we saw some good things happen on that ship, right? Uh, even with the sailors. So we even th think of like, God's sovereignty even in the midst of all of that. And our minds go, you know, kind of explode with that whole concept. Because we know he did disobey. He did. But yet also God used that also for the good of those sailors that were on that ship as well. But regardless, ultimately those sailors throw him overboard. Jonah, that is. They throw Jonah overboard. The, 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 the sea is calmed instantaneously by God's power. Um, and then we know that a big fish swallows up Jonah. 
and we know he has this wonderful location of a prayer uh, to call out to God right there in the belly of this big fish. And he calls out to God and God responds, ultimately vomiting uh, Jonah up onto the dry land, right? As we saw in Jonah chapter two, verse 10. But then as we saw in Jonah three, verse one, as we just read, it says, now the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. The, the, the instruction's the same, right? Arise and go to that city, go to Nineveh and proclaim what I'm telling you to go proclaim. Arise and go, which we looked at in our very first study in this book starting in chapter one. But here, this is the second time. So God uh, calls again, or we saw it as the call repeated. And the question was, as we asked last week, was you know, is, this is a moment of testing for Jonah. What will he do? Will he run again? Will he, or will he go in response? Which really is a big test because remember, he made a vow to God in that belly of that fish as he prayed and called out to God. He says, like, I, I, I'm going to get things right. I'm going to follow you um, and I am going to be obedient to you. Um, as you see there in chapter two, verse nine, it says, but I will sacrifice to you with the voice of thanksgiving, that which I vowed I will pay. He's making promises. He's giving praises to God. There's this, there's this indication of submission to God. So what does God do? All right, I'm going to call you out again a second time. Let's see how you fulfill your willingness to be obedient to those instructions that I'm going to give. And so we looked at it from the standpoint that really the call of God is upon all people's life, whether it is in a general sense. There's some very specific things which we looked at last week, right? That God calls very specifically all those who are his to do particular things. One is a very simple one. Go into all the nations and go, pre go declare, right? Go make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them. Uh, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, Matthew 28, 19 and 20. And we looked at other things, even just the desire to care and the willingness to care for those that are in need. Um, we see that instruction that God gives to those who are followers of him. Um, if God is, he tells us in Romans chapter 12, which we looked last week, that God enables all believers with certain gifts, right? He, he empowers, he enables every single believer, every single person who follows Jesus Christ, he gives them a gift. And so the instruction of, uh, that is found in Romans 12 is, well, if you've been given those gifts, go use them. Well, that's a call of God, right? That's an instruction of God. I've given you this, now go do something with it, right? Um, so we see that in a general sense. Now, obviously with Jonah, it's a very specific thing. Go to a particular place, go to a particular people and, and say a particular thing, right? And we know that God calls people to do specific things as well. The question is, is what do you do when God calls. Well, we saw that Jonah obeyed, verses 3 and 4 of chapter 3. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. So he responded, right? And we talked about the whole idea of the three days walk. And, you know, it's like eh, there's some confusion as to what the author was really specifically getting at as to the three days walk. Was it a reference to the size of the city? Um, I said I looked at it this way, is that he spent three days from morning to evening, from sun up to sun down, going kind of zigzagging through the city, um, spending a day at a time and going and proclaiming. That's how I would interpret it, but you don't have to be dogmatic on that. So, um, but then here, so that was A and B, so we had the idea of um, uh, the call repeated and letter B, the call obeyed. And here we are where we pick up in letter C, the call heard, right? The call heard. So let's look at verses five through nine one more time. Let's read those one more time to refresh our memories. Now that we have some of our gears turning in our mind, we are refreshed with that thinking. Chapter three, verse five through nine. It says, then the people of Nineveh believed in God and they called the fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. When the word reached the king of Nineveh, he arose from his throne, laid aside his robe from him, covered himself with sackcloth and sat down on the ashes. 
He issued a proclamation and it said in Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let man, beast, herd, or flock taste a thing. Do not let them eat or drink, but both man and beast must be covered with sackcloth and let men call on God earnestly that each may turn from his wicked way and from the violence which is in his hands. Who knows? I love that little phrase. Who knows? God may turn and relent and withdraw his burning anger so that we will not perish. I'm just curious. Anybody have another translation other than um, uh, New American Standard, what I'm reading from? What does it say at the beginning of verse 9 where I said, who knows? Does anybody else have a, another statement? I didn't look that up in other. What do you have, Noreen? Who, okay, who can tell, right? What else? Anybody else have something different? Is that ESV? Yeah, Okay. So I love that whole idea, and we're, we're going to get to that in a few things. But there's four, I think, key things to notice of the Ninevites in their, in their response of God's call to them to repent. Remember, he's using Jonah as the mouthpiece, as the spokesperson, and he's calling him to respond in obedience, to go and tell these people. He's saying to them, verse 4, this is the specific statement of the call, which we looked at last week. He says, yet 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown. There's a call, he, there's a warning, if you will. There's a warning there. That he says, hey, if you don't respond to this, there's going to be a response that Nineveh will be overthrown. Um, we knew that the Assyrians are moving in close. We looked at that last week. Um, there could have been a very significant threat, something that has kind of heightened their senses to hear and respond to the voice of God, possibly. But they respond. They hear the statement. They hear the statement. There's four things, four key things, I think, in this text, verses 5 through 9, that really stand out uh, regarding Nineveh's response. So they hear this. Right? In verse 5, they hear this statement. He says, then the people of Nineveh believed in God, and then they responded in a certain way. There's four different things in which they did. The first thing is, what did he do? They responded by fasting. They responded by fasting. Now imagine, first of all, their willingness to believe in God. Again, what motivated them to that? I have no idea. I have no, no, there's no indication as to what motivated them. All we have is this knucklehead prophet walking around telling them that the city is going to be overthrown in 40 days. Probably not said in the, in the greatest tone of voice. Probably not said in the greatest passion because we've seen his life already. He hasn't been the most willing. And as we see in chapter 4, verse 1, as we pointed out last week, he was displeased at their response to repent. So, you can't imagine that there was a lot of uh, emphasis in his in zeal and passion in, in his uh, proclamation to these people to repent. So what could it be that turned their attention to, um, to him, to God? But as it says there, they believed in God and their response was what? They responded in a fast. Obviously, a fast is abstaining from food or, or some other pleasure or need, right, for a period of time, um, really with a means to increase one's awareness of God, you know, to kind of um, make one in, in a place of need. So there's a kind of a desperation. There's a place of need in which there, there would be a, a more of a sensitivity to respond to the things of God. There's a, an amazing passage over in the book of Isaiah. Turn over there really quick. Isaiah chapter 58. There's an amazing passage here that talks about um, fasting. And it's... it's it's worded in such a powerful way. Isaiah chapter 58. Look at verses 5 through 12. Um, now if you look in the previous verses before we get to verse 5, if you just glance your eyes, particularly like verse 3, it says, why have we fasted and you do not see? There is this there's this perspective of the people of Israel like, hey, we're fasting, but you're not responding, God. What gives? Um, 
And here God's going to respond and give them some instruction. He's really going to challenge them. Kind of, what's your motivation behind all this fasting? What's your goal in this? What's your heart in this? And to see that the Ninevites, as we, you know, as we're going to see there in the book of Jonah, to see that the Ninevites responded by fasting, and then God relents um, there in verse nine. 9 and 10, God relents and turns his anger away from them, we would have to assume that their, uh, the sincerity of their heart and the intentionality of their heart was pure, that their fast was coming from the right attitude of heart, which really is described here in Isaiah 58 um, to the people of Israel. He says, is it a fast like this, starting in verse 5, Isaiah 58, 5. Is it a fast like this which I choose a day for, for a man to humble himself? Is it for bowing one's head like a reed and for spreading out sackcloth with ashes as his bed? Will you call this, fa- this a fast even an acceptable day to the Lord? These are challenging statements because of the previous context. In other words, he's kind of questioning their motives, questioning their sincerity. Is this the kind of fast that you're calling to me? Now he's going to go and describe the pure motivation of what a fast should be. Look at verse 6. Is this not the fast which I choose? And here it is. Here's the description. To loosen the bonds of wickedness. You can imagine stopping, pausing in one's life, Choosing to fast, whether that's over a period of time for, from food, whether it's from uh, some other kind of pleasure of life uh, or necessity of life. He says, is this not the fast which I choose to loosen the bonds of wickedness, to undo the bands of the yoke and to let the oppressed go free and to break every yoke? There's a separation as a goal to this fasting, Right? There's a separation, there's an end product that is in view of being completely um, unyoked to the things of this world, but to be free towards God. Continue on, look at verse seven. Is it not to divide your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into the house when you see the naked to cover him and not to hide yourself from your own flesh? In other words, it's a change of heart towards even uh, other individuals. So the a result of the fast should be a um, character-changing type of thing in one's life. It should change perspective in, in one's life. Continue on. Look at verse 8. Then your light will break out like the dawn, and your recovery will speedily spring forth, and your righteousness will go before you. The glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. It's like, hey, you have the right motivation and the right intentionality behind this with the right attitude. Look at what God is promising. He's promising victory. He's promising the right victory for them as a people. Verse 9, then you will call and the Lord will answer. You will cry and he will say, here I am. Remember what they said back in verse 3? Hey, haven't we fasted? Haven't we fasted and you do not see? Come on, God. Why aren't you seeing this? Look at, look at the second part of verse three. Why have we humbled ourselves and you do not notice? Behold, on the day of your fast, you find your desire and drive hard all your workers. And so he's like, man, you're over here fasting, but on the other side, your character isn't being changed. That's not sincerity, that's religious practice. And what God is interested in isn't in the religious practice. Oh, you know, pat yourself on the back, guys, because you are fasting. Good job. Well, what's your heart towards me? What's your motivation? Is it to re- re- kind of release the bonds and the yoke of this world so your attention will be drawn to him? Or is it simply just for religious purposes. And so God describes to these people, the Jews, and he says, calls them on, you know, he describes with clarity as to what the purpose should be and drives them to integrity even in their fasting. He says, hey, 
you do this with the right attitude and you set the heart with the right place of humility, well, now we're going to be in the place for God to hear. Otherwise, God isn't going to hear. It'll be a vain practice, a religious practice that is done and you're just wasting your time. Look at verse 10. Um, I'm sorry, verse 9. We skipped verse 9, didn't we? No, we, we read halfway through. We'll, we'll read verse 9 again. It says, Then you will call, and the Lord will answer. You will cry, and he will say, Here I am. If you remove the yoke from your midst, the pointing of the finger and speaking wickedness, and if you give yourself to the hungry and satisfy the desire of the afflicted, uh, afflicted, then your light will rise in darkness and your gloom will become like like midday. In other words, there's going to be um, the, the sun's going to rise on your occasion, on your misery, on your captivity. You will have victory. In verse eleven. The Lord will continually guide you and satisfy your desire in scorched places and give strength to your bones and you will be like a watered garden and like a spring, water, like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. Those from among you will rebuild the ancient ruins. You will raise up the age-old foundations and you will be called the repairer of the breach, the repairer of the restorer of the streets in which to dwell. And, and where is, what's the center of this restoration? Fasting, but not just simply the practice that's vain and empty hearted. It's, it's sincerity with the right place and the right motivation and the right attention towards God to be loosed from the pains and, and the yoke of this world and have one's attention drawn to God. Now, with that in mind, go back to Jonah. Again, like I said, we see in verse 10, when God saw their deeds, they turned, that, um, that they turned from their wicked way, then God relented. Now think of the people of Israel, as we just read in Isaiah. They were fasting, but it wasn't turning from their wicked way. So to see the outcome, we can see the outcome here. At the outcome of this fasting, we have to assume, as opposed to the people of Israel at the time that we were reading there in Isaiah 58, we have to assume that the people of Nineveh were responding with the right attitude, right? That their fasting was with sincerity, was with the right motivation and the right humility. Again, verse 5, And the people of Nineveh believed in God, and they called a fast. And then we see that they put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. Then when the word of the Lord reached the king of Nineveh, he arose from his throne, laid aside his robe from him, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat on the ashes. Now, what picture is here? I don't know. Did I put letters in your notes? Yes, I did. What's letter H? What do you think it is? Humility. And that's the picture of, of sackcloth, right? And ashes. It's the place to put yourself in the place of humility. You recognize that you are a violator, right? You recognize that you have come to the place of wrong. Humility, and really also the idea of repentance is also in view here. This idea, so this fasting is connected to this place and this position of humility. One surrendering oneself to a place under God and thus having the attitude of, um, of repentance. Notice that even when it reached the king, what did he do? He rose from his throne, and what else did he do? Other than, other than putting on sackcloth and sitting in ashes, what else did he do? Took off his robe. He, he was willing to take off that sign of authority and set that aside. When he heard the proclamation that in 40 days the, the nation of Nineveh is going to be overthrown, what was his response? Was, Man, I am nothing. I'm going to stand up, I'm going to drop my robe, my royal robe, I'm going to lay it aside, signifying that I have no authority, I have no power over this, I need to go to the place of humility, really to this place of surrender, um, 
and go to that, really respond in that kind of attitude, right? Remember, the outcome was that God relented. I was thinking of this. <clears throat> um, over in the book of Esther, by the way, I think somebody has a little uh, known fact about the book of Esther, right, Michelle? Uh, what was the known little tidbit of information that you learned about the book of Esther that you could share with everybody? In the book of Esther, God's name is never mentioned. Yep, that's right. God's name is never mentioned in the book of Esther. If you ever go through the study of the book of Esther, um, you'll never see God's name definitely referred to. Um, but not in, the, not in a specific sense. Um, it's very interesting. But Esther chapter 4. Um, and by the way, this is, this is like, if you've never studied the book of Esther, you don't know the story of the book of Esther. Uh, remember, Esther becomes the uh, queen. And uh, Haman is not a good guy, right? He's one of the king's right-hand guys. Um, and he's not a good guy, and he really doesn't like the Jewish people, and um, he's like, man, I've got to figure out a way to get everybody, kind of everybody that doesn't um, bow to you and honor you as king in, in a place almost like of worship and praise. And man, I've got to figure out a way to uh, yeah, take them all out, and he does, and he's sly, and he's sneaky about it, but Mordecai, um, Esther's uncle, right? Esther's uncle. Um, he responds when he hears about this edict that comes from the king because of Haman's um, sneakiness, uh, maliciousness. Notice what he does. Esther chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. It says, when, Mo when Mordecai learned all that had been done, Notice what he did. He tore his clothes. He put on sackcloth and ashes. Sackcloth is like kind of like animal's hair, very similar to that. It could be very similar to like burlap sack, you know. I mean, that kind of scratchiness. And I don't know if you were lacking a shirt, if you'd run, a, run to go and put a burlap sack on. Probably wouldn't be the most comfortable thing to wear. Um, and that's the idea of it. It's, it's to signify that humility and... Um, kind of just that, that grieving and sinful condition. He says, he put on sackcloth and ashes and went out into the midst of the city and wailed loudly and bitterly. Can you imagine seeing some guy wearing some sackcloth, putting ashes all over him, and going out in the middle of the city and just wailing? And this is very, very expressive. As he went as far as the king's gate, for no one is to enter the king's gate clothed in sackcloth. In each and every province where the command and de decree of the king came, there was a great mourning among the Jews. They heard this and were like, man, we, our, our doom is set. How did they respond? The Jews, in this case, responded. They responded with great mourning. Um, as it says there among, among the Jews, with fasting, weeping, and wailing, and many lay on sackcloth and ashes. What was the response of the Jews when they heard of this doom that was coming their way? They responded in humility, by fasting, right? They responded in great humility. Number three, coming back to Jonah chapter three. Another thing that we notice, and look at verses 7 through 8. So we see um, a fast. We see humility in the text, even with the king laying aside his garment, his robe, and sitting himself in, in ashes and putting sackcloth on. We see in verses 7 and 8, really a proclamation or an exhortation that is made by the king. So now the king of the nation issues a decree across all of Nineveh, this is what you will do as a nation. You will also fast. Look at 7 and 8. He issued a proclamation and it said, 
In Nineveh, by the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let man, beast, herd, or flock taste a thing. Do not let them eat or drink water, but both man and beast must be covered with sackcloth and let man call on God earnestly that each may turn from his wicked way. Which remember, back in Isaiah, remember? That, that removing that yoke. It, it's, this king's got it right. Turn from your wicked way with this attitude of humility and that of repentance. Go to the place of fasting. Go to the place of sitting in sackcloth and sitting in ashes and wearing that sackcloth. Let each man call on God earnestly. Cry out to him like, like, like uh, uh, Mordecai did, right? Wail loudly as a nation. Call out on him. Call on God earnestly, verse 8, that each may turn from his wicked way and from the violence which is in his hands. In other words, repent. Change your behavior. Turn away. Ask for forgiveness from this uh, violence that they have been known for. So there's an exhortation. The king or the governor issued that citywide fast and repentance. That's pretty remarkable a pagan nation, and hear a king calling out and giving this decree, you will respond. Can you imagine, can you imagine if the leaders of our nation would make such an exhortation or decree across our land? Huh? It'd be easier to follow them? <laughs> well, that, there's maybe some truth to that. Um, but man, and can you imagine if the nation responded? What would God do? Number four, lastly, surrender. Surrender. And the reason I use that word is because of that interesting little word, that little phrase that I called out in there in verse nine. Who knows? Who knows? Huh? Yeah, who knows? Verse four. Who knows? Verse nine. Did I say verse 4? It's in verse 9. It's number 4, surrender. But verse 9, who knows? God may turn and relent and withdraw his burning anger so that we will not perish. This is, a, this is an indication of a surrender to God's sovereignty. They're not standing in the place of, of yeah, they call out to God, but they're not standing in a place of dictating to God. They're not standing in the place of ordering God to respond in a certain way. They're requesting God to respond in a certain way. But I love that little, those two little words in, in my Bible, that verse 9 in New American Standard. Who knows? I mean, we've done, we've responded. We've, we've fasted. We've, we've, we've responded with humility and repentance. Uh, the king has made an exhortation to make this a citywide fast and and. Uh, really an attitude of repentance, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. Now we just have to surrender our, all, that we can, all that we can do. We've done what we can do. Our response is done. We can go no further. Now it lies in the hands of our God, right? Who knows? God may turn and relent and withdraw his burning anger so that we will not perish. Um, again, it's, it's, I believe it kind of communicates this idea, a statement of accepting God's sovereign and just decision. Yeah, they want God to relent, but they also recognize that they can go no further. They can't turn this away. The only one that can make this decision is God. What a great picture of a, of a pattern of of responding to God's call and God's warning and um, really his attention and him kind of proclaiming through his word to us in the things in which we go wrong and the areas where, where we go uh, astray and our call or God's call to us is simply to repent of those things, turn away from those things. And so we should have an attitude. And I think there's a good principle to follow here. There should be this picture in our lives of following this pattern and saying, hey, I will respond in such a way. I will respond with an attitude of, re of fasting from time to time. I will respond in an attitude of surrender with humility. But ultimately, I leave it to God and his 
people. There's a picture of this over in the book of Exodus, Exodus chapter 32. You can just write this reference down, 32 verse 30, Exodus 32, 30. And you remember when the people of Israel, with, after the whole golden calf incident, <laughs> remember that whole incident? And Moses was like, gosh, you guys, <laughs> uh, things didn't go so well. God was, I'm, I'm going to be faithful to my promise, but I'm not going to go with you. I'm not going to continue to travel along the way. I'll be faithful to my covenant promise, but I'm not, I don't want to go before you in the same sense that I have always been. And what did they do? They repented. And there, this verse says, um, well, I don't have the reference to the, I don't have the, actually the verse written in my notes. I'll, I'll look it up. Exodus chapter 32, verse 30. The, the, the reference uh, from Moses, he says this. Um, Exodus 32, 30. He says, on the next day, Moses said to the people, you yourselves have committed a great sin, and now I am going to the Lord. And he says this, perhaps I can make atonement for your sin. In other words, I will try, I will try to to, uh, um, calm down the wrath of God by making a sacrifice and bringing a sacrifice before God and showing our, our heart to repent before him. But it's still a sense of, Perhaps it ultimately lies upon, and the, the response of that and God's sovereignty will be um, fulfilled according to his plan and his decision. And so there comes a point in time where we respond how we're supposed to respond, but then we just simply surrender that over to God. I think that's so important to understand. And then letter D, you see there in your notes, the call fulfilled. It was fulfilled, right? Verse 10. God called Jonah to go to the, to the Ninevites, go and proclaim, yet 40 days. Um, and you will be overthrown. There's this warning to them. It worked. Of course it did. God's sovereign. But when God saw their deeds, verse 10, that they turned from their wicked way, then God relented concerning the calamity which he had declared he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. God relented because the people of Nineveh repented, right? There was a responsibility on behalf of the individuals of Nineveh, at really as a nation, to, to come and rise up and respond to that warning that was there. And they needed to respond with an attitude of repentance. And then God relented from that. I brought out last week that even though Jonah had not been the most faithful example, he wasn't the most... Um, he wasn't the greatest example of, of, of a man that has, you know, surrendered to God in every way and, you know, you know not, not struggling in obedience to God. But he was faithful. He was obedient in this. He finally responded. And as I could point out last week, sometimes we just need to celebrate those little moments of obedience. Um, but... From the perspective of being in, in Jonah's shoes, have we responded? Um, how have we responded to God's call upon our lives? Does he have to keep coming back um, to us and keep calling us um, as those who are his servants? But from the, from the perspective of being in the Ninevites' shoes, you know, have we responded to God's warning of judgment by humbling ourselves before God and surrendering our lives to his sovereign will? I'm assuming that if you are here tonight, you've done that. Um, that you're, you have already responded to God's call upon your life and the offer of salvation by putting your faith in him and repenting of your sins. But if you haven't, follow the example of the Ninevites and repent and turn and surrender to God. 